Welcome to our talk about uh, taming HX and Django. This guy next to me is Jeremy Blaser, and he works at Darlink, as mentioned before. The guy next to me is Mark Ely. He works as a backend developer at Darlink. So we at Darlink, we are a small web agency. We are doing a lot of small projects using Django. So for us, it's not one big product. We are creating multiple sites every month. Okay. So we are going to talk about uh, address and state handling, uh, about content rendering, and how our approach to these two topics uh, works. So when using AJAX, uh, there are some challenges. The first one is uh, state and address handling, because uh, that's the way browsers work. And uh, the second one is content rendering, because now you have uh, the server, the client, and you can render your templates either on the server or on the client or do something crazy in between. And uh, while doing that, you have to Make sure that uh, search engines are happy with your site because you need them uh, to index your site. Yeah. Uh, the first problem with these challenges is the browser history. You want your site to be uh, able to. Uh, you want to your customer to be able to use the back button in the uh, in the browser, and. Uh, so that's why you need something to make that work. Uh, and then there's the not another problem that your history only contains one entry if you're just doing Ajax. And that's uh, kind of the same problem uh, with the back button. The second problem is uh, deep linking. You want your site to be deep linkable so that uh, clients or users end up on a site deep inside your web, uh, web application if they come from outside. Uh, and the third problem is uh, crawler visibility. You want crawlers to be able to crawl your site and index it. And most of them don't execute JavaScript, or they execute JavaScript, but they don't use it to index your site. So you have to do something to convince them to index your site. Uh, and that's the same problem. You need an URL for them to link to. So the first solution uh, for so, uh, such a problem would be using a hash fragment. Then if you're using a hash fragment, your URL uh, would look like this. And technically, all the things, oh, oops. All the things after the hash aren't transferred to the server, and you have to manage them in uh, your JavaScript. And that's uh, a way you can uh, uh, use state in the browser. So, uh, oops. For example, this is a, a website. Oops. Using a hash fragment for navigation. And this is uh, basically a wine cellar. And what you see here, if I click uh, on a button, oops. Oh, okay. Then uh, the hash fragment changes. And there, the pages doesn't reload. And uh, you manage everything with JavaScript. So if I click on this wine bottle, I have the details for it. So now I have a, an URL for this uh, specific site. But without JavaScript, uh, it isn't visible. And so the pros, it's easy to implement. Uh, it's good for web applications like uh, this uh, wine cellar. For example, this presentation also uses hash fragments. But it's not good 
for uh, search in, uh, search engines because they cannot uh, they cannot index your uh, website, and so your website is technically only the enter page. The second solution for using uh, for solving these problems uh, is using a uh, hash bang. It's almost the same. Now you have uh, an exclamation mark after the hash. And what's the difference? Search engines like Google, they replace uh, URLs with a uh, hash bang in it, and they uh, convert it to this second URL. Uh, what this is doing, it uh, converts your hash parameter, which is only on your client, to a get parameter, which is, uh, of course, visible to your server. And uh, they will fetch the second URL. Uh, this is uh, this uh, uh, is made by Google, and they have a whole uh, documentation about it: how to make your Ajax uh, websites using HashBang uh, crawlable. I have uh, th this is the Olink website. This is pretty old. Therefore, we're using a hash bang there. And for uh, uh, the team website, uh, the team page, we have uh, allink.ch slash hash bang slash team slash. And this is converted by uh, the search engine to this URL. And here we serve kind of the same page. Maybe you noticed. Uh, the content under the page isn't there in the in the Google view, but it, this page doesn't use uh, the JavaScript at all. So it, you can fetch it, you can index it, but that's all. And oops. Now here, every page. Uh, is uh, deep linkable, but if you're reloading on a page like this, the deep link always uh, loads the first page, page, page first and then loads the content after it. So it's not a nice solution. And in your sitemap, you should have uh, the URLs using hashbang because that's the way uh, is this visible hmm. because that's the way uh, it will end up in the Google search results and you don't want to have an escaped fragment kind of URL in your search results so there are other uh, companies to, who implemented hashbang for example facebook if you share a link on facebook using a hashbang then facebook will also convert it to escaped fragment and they now i think they fixed it but before it was kind of broken because when you shared the link it looked okay on facebook it uh, showed up with a hashbang but if uh, when you clicked it you ended up on the url which was uh, designed for the search engine and not for the browser. But now it's fixed and Bing is also uh, implementing it. Maybe, no, not maybe, there are other companies implementing it and it's kind of a standard. So the, uh, what are the pros? It works with almost all browsers. Uh, it's the first solution which covers all three problems mentioned earlier. But the cons are you have to maintain multiple URLs for every page. It's really difficult sometimes because if, when you change your URL scheme and you decide to not use hash fragments anymore, then you have to check in JavaScript if the page who is loaded actually has a hash fragment in the URL because the hash fragment doesn't get transferred to your server. And how to implement? Uh, you could implement this uh, in Django using a middleware. The, uh, this middleware 
should detect uh, if an escaped fragment is uh, available. And if so, then provide uh, a search engine view which renders all the content, but uh, in a way that doesn't need JavaScript. So now, the third solution uh, would be push state. Now your URL looks uh, like this. This is exactly the same as it would look like if you're not using uh, Ajax at all, which is a nice thing. Uh, oops, I have also a demo for this that you all know about. It's uh, GitHub. GitHub uses a push state for the file browser down here. And it's a nice thing because if you're loading a deep link, like now, then you end up directly on this page. You don't need to go through the entry page and then using JavaScript and load this particular page. So that's kind of the, the way it should be. So the pros are Every URL is bookmarkable and works as an entry point, as I mentioned before. It's fully ex uh, SEO accessible without any special views or so. It's easier to implement on the backend, which is good for me. I'm a backend developer. And it gracefully degrades for non-JS or non-push state clients. So they are just uh, uh, loading each view uh, individually. Like uh, if you're using uh, I for, uh, on GitHub, then you have to reload every page if you're using the file browser down here. And what are the cons? It's harder to implement. You need more code uh, in JavaScript, which is fine for me, but it's not well supported. Like it's, it runs on IE 10, but not on IE 9 because it lacks of uh, push state. And yeah, if you can convince your client that IE9 is, uh, is uh, a legacy browser, then it's fine. We managed to convince some of our clients that IE9 is old. But it's not that bad because they are getting kind of the same experience, but without the transition. Router and backbone history and some link clicking and form submission eye checking. Uh, of course, you can do this with plain jQuery. We just stick this uh, backbone because we are already familiar with it. So that's uh, our template inheritance structure looks like. Um, you have this uh, content HTML template in the center. Uh, and this is uh, the one you extend in every uh, other of your templates and uh, the content HTML template in turn extends conditionally either the, the base HTML template or the base PJAX. This conditional switch is done by the by this PJAX filter tag up here and it works by filtering the request and checks uh, with the method is AJAX if it's been originated from an AJAX request or just a normal browser request. Um, the other parts of the content HTML template, we have just the blocks here, the title block, the page block, and the navigation block. Here's the source for the PJAX uh, filter. And as I already said, it's really simple just using this is AJAX method on the request. And in a later step, we use also the JSONify filter. It's just a simple JSON dumps, uh, which is marked saved afterwards. So now the base PJAX HTML template is just uh, JSON. And what it does is it captures the, the blocks we have in our content template and passes them to this filter tag which applies the JSONify filter to the whole block which is encapsulated. On the client side, we use, as I said before, the backbone history. 
here with arguments push state true and the hash change false as we don't want you know hash fragments and also silent sets to true that you can use deep links and it doesn't uh, trigger the roots on the first load then we list for link clicks and form submissions and handle them by our application which is done here in the second part our app router so when you click the link the handle link click method is called and it just calls the navigate method of our app router with the RF value of our link this triggers uh, the root defined up here which in turn triggers the path change method and this method simply does a HX request with the defined URL and renders and returns the return data to the render blocks method which in turn just replaces the, the HTML content of the specified uh, divs with the data in the JSON return. We have a little demo for this. So we have this page here with a little CSS animation in the background to better visualize this. So when I change the, the page through the navigation here, the animation keeps running and here is a form I can fill out and it works also can do a full reload on one of the page and I get exactly the same point So while implementing this, we encountered a few pitfalls we want to share with you. Uh, especially there are issues with caching and redirecting. First, caching, uh, when you cache the full page source or and the JSON from the same URL, uh, the browser gets easily confused, uh, it's non-determined. So to solve this, uh, additionally to the cache control header, to set the very header with the value x requested if. This tells the browser to uh, regard a, a request to the same URL as a different request when, when the x requested if header is present. And browsers set this uh, up automatically when they do an hx request. We do this in our PHX middleware in a process a response processor with the patch very header method from the Django utils cache. Now the first solution uh, actually introduces a second issue, which is because the browsers are, or some of the browsers are ignoring the very header, namely Safari and Chrome. And Chrome did this up until the version 25 which is the second most recent version. So it works only recently, started to work only recently. To overcome this again, you have to bend over your RHX requests to a different URL. We do this by using a prefix and then remove this prefix again in our middleware. And the important thing here is to also remove it from the not just from the request path, but also from the path info, because that's the attribute that is used in the URLs parsing. Uh, there's another issue with redirecting, because you're doing redirect after post. And uh, if you're doing that uh, and uh, doing a post uh, in JavaScript, then the redirect is handled transparently. So you have no idea that the redirect has happened. So uh, to solve this problem, we uh, unredirect those uh, redirects and uh, return a JSON response, which looks like this. It's like a status code 301 and the redirect uh, equals true. And uh, this is 
then handled on the client side to use uh, replace state instead of push state, which uh, kind of does the same like uh, uh, when you're doing a redirect, then you're deleting the state before from the history. Uh, the, this is done using a middleware, and it's pretty simple. It's just if the request uh, has, uh, is an AJAX request and the response has status code either 301 or 302, then return this uh, JSON code. Of course, client-side templates have their reason to live too. I have an example here for when they make sense. So we have this watch collection here with a small filter over there. And as you change the filter, the collection display changes. This is done by a client-side JavaScript uh, application. And to filter these uh, watches, it already needs the, the whole of the data from one watch, so from the model. And now it's reasonable to also use the same data to, to render the, the detail view of such a watch. And this is where client-side templates uh, happily come in. Now the, the good thing about uh, or what would be good is then when you can reuse your server-side templates also on the client that you don't have to duplicate your code and introduce additional complexity. We have played around recently with the plate JavaScript uh, library which renders Django templates on the, in the browser. Uh, it's from a guy named Chris Dickinson. There are, however, a few things you need to be aware of when using them. Namely, you don't have the full context available, so no request objects, and also the query sets uh, look different. So this is a comparison of the normal Django template and the plate template. Uh, first, when you, when you include your plate templates in, a, in your uh, Templates, you have to use the verbatim tag to hinder the Django template engine to actually render this, this code because it's just Django template language. Then uh, you do this typically in an inside a script tag and later you use the, the ID from this script on the client side to, to fetch the, the template. And when it comes to query sets, like we have here in the original Django template, the images.all, for example, this isn't available, so you have to introduce special accessor methods which get you this information, like, like here. Also, nested objects might not work depending on the, the REST API you are using and your client-side models. And we stick with just writing uh, custom attribute methods to as accessor to these uh, attributes. And of course, this looks a bit ugly here. Uh, this uh, was just an experiment for us. In a further version, we would perhaps uh, introduce a Django template tag which uh, you could pass the, the template name you wanted to include and which all this encapsulating in the script tag and the verbatim stuff would do for, uh, for us. So the demo code of our PJAX demo is available in the GitHub repository. The slides are also online and that's it. Thank you. Thank you.